Good morning. Welcome to worship at Northminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Reverend Jenny Carlson. And so, uh, so happy to have all of you here in the sanctuary and those of you who are joining us online on Zoom this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements before we get going. Uh, the first is we have a barbecue that had been scheduled at the Kurtz residence for the 26th. However, uh, George has been having a lot of bouts of allergies and Anne just felt it would be easier if they didn't hold it. Um, at this time. So we are canceling that. Uh, there still will be a barbecue at the Hammers uh, residence a few weeks later. Uh, so just know that the one that's coming up in a few days is now canceled. Um, I am on vacation as of tomorrow for the next two weeks, uh, so no Bible study for the next couple of weeks. Uh, but we will have the Fiber Arts Gathering on the 29th. So if you want to come and hang out in the library for uh, an hour or so and work on whatever knitting or um, embroidery or whatever kind of project that you have going on at the moment, you can still come and hang out in the library on, the tw on Saturday the 29th starting at 10.30. Um, and then our uh, next faith formation will be after I get back. So that'll be on August 10th. Uh, are there any other announcements that folks have? No? Okay. All right, let us go ahead and take in a deep breath and settle our hearts and our minds, remembering that we have been loved since before the foundation of the world. So let us worship God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship and stand if you are able. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Lord, sometimes our lives have such little focus. We have so much to do. We possess so much stuff. We are driven by the need for still more. 
and it easily seems to control us. We're sorry, Lord, for how distracted we've become and for losing our way without even realizing it. Forgive us and help us to know that you are the only one we need. Amen. As creator, God made us and knows us fully. When we bring our full selves in front of God, our imperfections become part of our perfection in God's eyes. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In God's grace, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We've come to our time of the passing of the peace and the way that we do that um, in the age of hybrid is I'll first extend a verbal peace to those who are joining us by telephone and then we'll have um, peace here within the sanctuary and those of you who are joining on Zoom um, with your computer can go ahead and type your messages of peace into the chat. So this morning we welcome um, with deep peace Dawn, Ethel, Russ and Phyllis and Sharon who are joining us by telephone this morning. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please turn to one another and exchange a sign of peace. Well, it's hard to know because it keeps going on and off, so. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll hope that solved it. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. All right, I apologize for the feedback. We, we don't know exactly where it's coming from, but. I'm not hearing it in Zoom, though, is the good thing. I'm only hearing it here. Yeah, I can't always hear the things in Zoom, though, as well. So hopefully, Zoom people, you're not being overwhelmed by that feedback. Um, so peace to all from Lori, uh, peace from Julia, love and peace to all from Winona, and um, on earth peace from Gary. Let us pray. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from 1 Samuel 8, verse 1, and then verses 4 to 18. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, you are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, 
Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. The word of the Lord.
All right, I would like to invite forward anyone who would like to participate in a story with me. It's going to be a good time this week. So come on down. Okay, before we start, I need some people to take some things who, what does this look like? Who would like to hold a fish? What does, what does this look like? It does look like a potato, what else does it look like? <laughs> Who would, who would like to hold some loaves of bread? Felix, would you like to hold them? You can hold more than one if you want to. You just hold on to those until I ask for them back. You've got a bread and a, okay. And now, what does this look like? A boat! I would like to tell you a story about one time when Jesus and his friends got into a boat. Can you get into the boat with me? Can you get into the boat? And they sailed across the Sea of Galilee all the way to the other side. And when they got to the other side, they saw all those people waiting to see them. Do you know how many there are? It's a lot. What's the biggest number you can think of? <laughs> a hundred. Way more than a hundred. A million. Not quite that many. <laughs> 5,000. Does that look like 5,000 people to you? Well, use your imagination. 5,000 people, and they spent the whole day going around and curing the sick. You're healed. You're healed. You're healed. Everybody was being cured. And as they did that, the sun started to get very low in the sky. And, the, and Jesus' friends looked at all those people, and they said, what happens at nighttime if you don't eat? How do you feel? What's that feeling when you need to eat? Starving. Starving. They said, look at all those people. They, they've been here all day, and they haven't eaten anything. They must be Star starving. But what will we feed them? What do we have to feed them? A few fish and a few loaves of bread. Can you put the fish in this basket? Can you put the bread in there too? Can we put some bread in this basket? Do you think this is enough food to feed 5,000 people? No. Well, let's just see. Now, if you are sitting in rows three or four, you've been cast in this play and you didn't even know you auditioned. <laughs> We're going to pass this food around. Will you pass it down for me? Pass this food around and we're going to share this food with everybody. And when it comes back, we are going to find that we have a few loaves of bread, a few fishes, and also some granola bars, uh, a fig newtons, um, some almonds. How did that happen? Well, how do you think that happened? Jesus and, well, I guess, I think it was God who made it. 
into a whole feast, and no matter how much food the people took and ate, there was still leftover. That's true. That's the story you were told. But I wonder if maybe what really happened was that all the moms in that crowd knew that they were going to be gone for a really long time. And they brought things like almonds and granola bars in their purse. And then when everybody was hungry, they said, oh, I have more than enough to share. And that when we come together as community and take care of each other and give away what we don't need, then we all are better for it. Do you think that might be what happened? Maybe. Maybe. Well, I've got something else. Pastor Jenny is going to tell us more about this story and what happened afterwards. It's really neat. Would you like to find out? Yeah? Okay, let's go back to our seats then. Thank you, Dustin. Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of John, uh, starting in chapter 6 with verse 14, and we'll read 14 through 20. I will be reading from the Dr. Gaffney translation, um, but feel free to follow along in your uh, pew Bibles or phone app if you want. When the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, multiplying the loaves and fish, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to kidnap him in order to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And when it was evening, his disciples went down to the sea and they boarded a boat and headed across the sea to Capernaum. Now it was dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea surged, a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about 25 stadia, about three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking upon the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And one of the history books that I read in college, and I apologize that I do not remember which one and I didn't keep it, so I can't provide the actual reference for you. But what I remember distinctly about the book was the author wrote that the reason he believed that George Washington will always sit at the top of the list of our greatest presidents is because he's the only one who never wanted the job. For both of his presidencies, there were no debates, there was no party convention or platform, no campaigning. He was elected unanimously by the Electoral College both times. He was the first of a total of six presidents to walk away from the job by not seeking reelection. And the precedent that he set of only serving two terms was honored by every president after him for almost 150 years before presidential term limits of no more than two terms in office was amended to the Constitution. And while we can acknowledge and should acknowledge Washington's faults as a slave owner, one thing that he does demonstrate is something that we encounter in our scriptures today. There's a difference between leadership and power. In our first reading, Samuel is a judge, which at this time for the people of Israel is a combination of sort of leader and priest. At this time, the rules of society were the rules of God. And the role of the judges is to ensure that the people are acting in accordance with what God has commanded. This is rooted in their scriptures where they have seen tragedy befall the people when God is displeased. And one aspect of theological thought is really important to understand at this time. At this moment in history, there is a belief that multiple gods do exist. After all, they were given a commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. So when two groups, whether it's races, nations, religions, but two groups of people come into conflict, they believe that their gods were warring in the heavenly realm 
the same as their people were warring in the earthly one. And when the people of Israel continued to be conquered, they still held this belief that they were the elected and chosen people of God. So they couldn't be losing because their God was weaker than the other gods. Instead, it had to be that God was opting not to fight for them. And why would God do that? Well, it must be because the people have not kept true to the law that had been handed down for them in the Torah. And if they lived as God commanded, then they would receive God's favor. And if they don't, then God would punish them. So they took their judges as their leaders to help them ensure that they were all living as God wanted them to live and so that they would prosper as a people. At the moment of our text reading today, Samuel has actually now retired and his sons are the active judges. And like Eli's sons a generation earlier that we talked about a few weeks ago, Samuel's sons are also ruling their power or using their power in a way that is making the people unhappy. But rather than going to the sons, the group of ruling elders who also have some authority among the people go around them to Samuel and ask him to ask God for new leadership. Now this committee of elders does have that authority on their own, but rather than entering into their conflict directly, as good leaders should, they're doing an end run around the current leadership and going to the guy that they used to follow and preferred. And this is actually an extremely common thing in religious groups. Um, and it is one of the reasons why when a pastor leaves a congregation, they're ethically bound to not have contact with that congregation for two years. So it, this actually comes, to, these rules come to us out of scripture. So Samuel hears their concerns, um, specifically uh, that they don't want a religious leader messing around in their lives, but they would like to have a strong political leader who will help them win the wars and conflicts that they're encountering. Now, whether Samuel actually agrees with this shift in direction of what the judges are to be, or he's just so swayed by the ego boost that they're still coming to him with their problems, he inserts himself into this local contest of power, and he prays their requests to God. And God's response here is very fascinating, because on the surface, it seems that God is endorsing what the people want. Yet they are going to experience the folly of their request for the next several generations. Their coming kings are not going to do all that they hoped. And God first tells Samuel, listen to the people. God wants Samuel to understand truly what it is that is being asked for, which is actually a rejection of God's authority not just a rejection of Samuel's sons or the concept of judges overall. Their request is that they want the power of God to be their own. Remember those battle between the gods? The people are saying, we no longer want to leave these outcomes of these wars to the heavenly realm. We want to ensure that we win on earth. God says, from the day that I brought them out of Egypt to this very day, forsaking me and serving other gods. The point here is not a treatise on this mythology or whether it's accurate, but that's not what God is really talking about here. God's rather highlighting that the people have been wanting to lay claim to this kind of power for a very long time. And this power over that the gods wield against each other is the power that they want to hold for themselves. And from a personal empowerment standpoint, that might sound great. In our modernity, we see conflict and war as existing between nations as fully human endeavors. And we can think that God has nothing to do with all of these things until we remember that 
Our most brutal and long-standing divisions are almost always about what? Religion. The proof that my God won and yours lost exists in my ability to force you to not only declare your belief in my God and to practice faith in my God, but since I won, I now can force you to behave in the ways that I believe God wants you to behave. So we wanted the power for ourselves, but we wanted to lay the blame for it on God. Now, the people didn't know that that was where all of this would be heading, but God did. And God tries to warn them by pointing out that the kind of power that they are wanting to hand over to human beings will lead those leaders to taking from them more than they actually want to give in tithe and in taxes, that those leaders will abuse them, and will be subjugating them because while humans can lead, humans cannot wield full power justly. Only God can do that. And perhaps that is a difficult thing to hear, but I do sincerely believe that it is true. We can have amazing leaders And I'm certain that you wouldn't have to think very hard to come up with a head of state, a boss, a pastor, a coach, anyone that you looked up to and respected and admired. But I would also guess that that person that you're envisioning right now did not abuse their power over you. If they were truly a good leader, they didn't abuse their power over anyone. I also know that if I ask you to bring to mind someone who had authority over you and wielded that power in ways that was hurtful or manipulative, unyielding, uncaring, abusive, there are probably many more faces that come to your mind's eye. Even the ones that can start out great, the pressures that power puts upon them can twist and change them. The saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely is rooted in very real truth. In our gospel reading, the lure of power that people saw after seeing Jesus create this miracle, this feeding of all of these people, The power that they saw in that was so seductive that they were willing to entrap him. Our version, the one I read this morning, said kidnap. In the NRSV, I believe it says capture. But basically, they wanted to force Jesus to use his obvious power for their own agenda. And what was his response? He walks away. Far away. (laughs) Jesus knows that the human systems and human beings themselves cannot justly wield the power of God. And later when he comes upon them in the dark of night, using that power to walk on water, they're terrified. That kind of power, God power, is frightening, precisely because in our hands, it would never yield anything but devastation. Now this is where we come to a specific question. Why, then, would God give the people what they asked for? We didn't get too far into our Bible study this week before that very question came up. If God has that power and knows how to wield it properly, why doesn't God intercede and save us from ourselves? 
Well, the reason is because God loves us. God loves us and wants us to return that love. But that relationship has no meaning if it's coerced. Throughout our scriptures, we see time and again, God attempting to create an environment of intimate relationship with us. And we are given a choice, choose God or not God. The original sin in the garden wasn't about figs or sex or nakedness. It was about choosing not God. God lays out our commandments, which are meant to guide us in how we can be in good relationship with God and with one another. And when we break them, we are again choosing not God. Jesus comes to earth, God in fully human flesh for the first time. And the whole point is to show us what it can look like if we choose love. Choose connection and community, choose justice. And we are so addicted to our own power, we murder him rather than listen. And even after that most incredible display of violation, we get to see what real power is as Jesus is resurrected to new life. And even then, so often we say, no, thanks, I'll choose not God. Now, despite some of our theological tenets, scripture teaches us that God doesn't want and has never asked for just blind obedience from us. Sometimes churches will tell you that that's what God wants, but that's not in scripture. God asks for relationship, but never forces it. We do that. God offers love, but doesn't demand it in return. We do that. God models leadership, by asking us to follow, but never enslaving or conscripting us to follow. We do that. Time and again, God could wield ultimate power over us and instead comes alongside of us, guiding us, whispering, connecting, leading. And in each moment waits for us to say yes, because it is only in the yes that God knows our response is real. That is true for our relationships with one another as well. And one of my favorite lines from the Harry Potter series comes from Dumbledore, who is Harry's teacher and mentor. And in a moment when Harry is questioning why he has to be the one that everyone is looking to lead at this time of war. Dumbledore says to him, it's a curious thing, but perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Those who, like you, have leadership thrust upon them, and they take up the mantle because they must, and then find to their own surprise that they wear it well. We are at a time, both as a Christian faith and as a country, even here in Seattle, where all around us are examples of those ill-suited to power wielding it. They wield it in the name of God. They wield it in the name of country. They wield it in the name of their own self-preservation. We see it. We lament it. And yet we struggle with how to respond to it. And like Jesus, our first instinct might be to just flee to the mountains, which is perfectly understandable. However, like Jesus, we do need to come back down and find our people. 
because that is what God-like leaders actually do. We need to come back and come alongside one another. We don't seek power, yet we need to respond when leadership is needed. We need to have the conversations that need having. We challenge what needs to be challenged. Most of all, we listen. And listening isn't passive. The very first thing that God tells Samuel to do is listen to the people. And implores us all the time to please listen to God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's the Shema, the most sacred prayer of the Jewish faith. And it begins with listening. Listening, engaging, loving, Power will tell you that those things are weak, that you're going to get taken advantage of, that no one ever wins a war with love. Yet Jesus won victory over death using exactly that. In John 15, 15, he says, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from God. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. Jesus conquered death itself, not by force, but by humility by sacrifice, by devotion, and by love. Christ laid that friend-based leadership at our feet a long time ago. And God calls to us still, encouraging us to take it on. And the good news is that when you take up the mantle of love, when you listen to God's voice and step into those places where you are called to lead, you will likely find, to your own surprise, that you wear it very well. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we are in a space and a time where those who seek power over seem to be drowning out those who seek to lead by coming alongside. That those who want to dictate exactly how we live, who we worship, whose opinions get to rule, that it is in these moments where those of us who may not seek power do need to seek leadership. Because you are calling us to speak a new kind of truth. Well, it's not that new actually. It's as ancient as time. The truth that when we listen well to you, that when we follow your command to love you and love one another, the world is transformed and your kingdom is made real on earth. So help us to look for those spaces where we are being called to lead whether we are being led in a conversation, whether we are being led to public office, whether we are being led to start a new ministry, whether we're just being led to gather people together for a meal, 
Whatever it is that we are being led to do, help us to listen well and to act in according to your service and dedication. All these things we pray in your holy name. Amen. Jen, I'll go ahead and have you come up and come on. So we are reinstalling uh, Miss Jennifer to active service as a deacon. So this doesn't take as long as when you were installed the first time, thankfully. Um, so we will just uh, go ahead and say a few words and then we'll pray over you. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of Northminster now recalls Jen Jensen to the ministry of deacon and installs her to active service in this congregation. So Jen, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I will. And to the congregation, do we members of the church accept Jen as deacon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we agree to pray for her, to encourage her, to respect her decisions, and to follow as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Okay. At this point, those of you who are deacons or elders, if you want to come forward and lay hands on Jen. All right, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so deeply thankful for your servant, Jen, and for her willingness to step forward and to use her gifts in the role of deacon. We pray that you will guide her, that you will encourage her, that you will give her the strength of 
um, presence and the gift of gentleness and knowing exactly what to say when people who are in need, who are hurt and suffering, who are uh, sick and injured, and those who may be dying. As she gathers around these people in their time of great need, that you will fill her with your spirit, that you will give her exactly what it is that you want her to say and do in those moments, and that you will continue to surround her with fellowship, as this work can be very difficult at times. And so we just pray that she will be able to gather with her fellow deacons and to lean on them for support and guidance, to build fellowship with them, and to encourage them as they also do this work. We are thankful to her also for the many gifts of music that she shares with us. And given that, that she has stepped forward into this incredible role is even more amazing. So we just thank you, we bless her, and we bless all of us who get to be in connection and community with her. In your holy name, amen. Thank you, congratulations, Jen. With words, music, acts of service and prayer, we offer our gifts to God. Holy One, we lift up our gifts in the building up of your kingdom. And we pray that these gifts be recognized and used for what they will be. In your name we pray. Amen. We come to our time of the prayers of the people. That's the way that we do that is I'll go ahead and pray for us collectively, and then I'll open it up for um, if you have your own prayers you want to lift up, uh, as well as those of you who are on Zoom, you can type your prayer requests into the chat, and then I'll close this all together with the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, the reality of summer has finally hit and we are so excited with travel plans, with concerts and um, World Cup soccer and all of the things that we get to delight in at this time of year. And so we are just excited in our happiness and the opportunities for joy and gathering that we have, both as a community and as a congregation, but also just the ways in which we are able to reach out to one another as we travel for vacations and things like that. And so we just ask for your blessing to be upon all of those who are traveling, um, those who are uh, taking some time to reconnect with family they haven't seen for a while, or maybe even to just enjoy the beauty and the simplicity of their own home that being able to find opportunity for rest is something that you acknowledge from the very dawn of creation, that for all of the moments where we are meant to work and to serve, we are also intended to rest. And so we ask for your blessing upon our rest. And for those who struggle sometimes to even find opportunities for rest, we ask for your inspiration and encouragement to remember that it is as holy and as vital as any and all work, because it is often in the rest that we can hear you most clearly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, as we move into the coming weeks, we know that there are those in our congregation who are facing surgery or who are currently dealing with um, different aspects of health, whether it is cancer or um, uh, 
treatments for cancer, or it's just preparation for getting your tonsils out. That these are times where our bodies don't work the way we want them to work, where they're not serving us the way that we had always counted on. Or sometimes they're just the realities of getting older and that these things come to us and they can leave us weary and tired. So Lord, we pray for your healing. We pray for energy. We pray for people to come alongside us who can help us in our moments of trial, whether it is through bringing us food, sitting next to us, holding our hands when we're scared, or offering us a ride when we need one. That all of these things are the ways in which we connect with one another in very deep and meaningful ways. So help us to be aware of the needs of those people in our midst, both here, in our homes, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods. Help us to keep an eye out for one another and to support each other as we go through these things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we know that you know all of the concerns and fears and hopes of our hearts, and that you hear them whether they are spoken aloud or not. So we offer them to you at this moment. Lord, we come together in one voice, saying the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Creator, in their great love, formed us. 
Jesus Christ in his great love lights our way, and the Holy Spirit in her great love emboldens us to go forward in just peace to love and serve our God and one another. May it be so. Amen.